looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Take out your little study sheet I gave to you. I want you to see the first part of it before I even get into my main outline. Because I want you to see doing things together, we can make a difference. If we do a couple of things. I wanted to put it out there right there for you. It says if we play by the rules in the relationship. And so you might say, what do you mean rules in the relationship? I set down some rules before I got married because I'm a bullet point kind of guy. Those of you that know me, I have lists upon lists. I've got all these sticky notes on my computer. I, everything is organized in my mind, and God keeps shaking it up to remind me you can't always control everything. But before I got married, I, I explained to Carol, this is how we're going to do the toothpaste. You know, how we're going to roll it up. And this is how we're going to put the toilet paper on the rack so it's on the outside rather than... I mean, I had everything. One week, that was gone, all right? That just did not work. But you have to play by the rules. Now, what are some, some common rules? Now, if this was a Bible study, I'd let you answer this. So answer it in your mind. But I'm going to give you two that are no-brainers. One rule in a relationship to make it work is simply this. Just tell each other the truth. Don't lie. Do you know what breaks relationships more than anything is when you lose confidence in the other person and all you're talking now about surfacey stuff like double coupons at the grocery store or you know what the weather's going to be like. But the real depth of a relationship is when you trust each other and trust is fragile. And all it takes is some prevarication going on, some lying, some deceit, some spinning of stories where well, you don't really trust that person. The second rule, which is real simple to keep in a relationship, and that is don't steal. Now, instead of just the negative, don't steal, flip it. Give. Give more than you get. And don't take from someone else something that doesn't belong to you. Don't abuse them, that kind of thing. So that's going to keep the relationship humming. Look at number two. kind of fits together. The second one I put down there is make kindness the trademark of relationships. Make kindness the kind of theme or the hallmark of your relationship. I was talking to someone on the mainland, and and if you're... The guests are here. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about somebody else. But on the mainland, they were calling me, and we're talking about Hawaii, and they knew we've lived here, and this is our, this is home. I mean, we burned all bridges, boxes, boats, everything. This is where this is this is, this is it. And they were saying to me, uh, "Relax, all. Don't come after me. Don't shoot the messenger. I hate Hawaii. How can you live so many miles away from everybody? All the different kind of ethnic groups. I don't even like the food over there. The temperature is always the same. It's so expensive to live there. How in the world can anybody in their right mind live in Hawaii? I'm going to tell you, that had tested my spirit so much. You know. Now, let me tell you, he has the freedom of speech, and I will die for him to have that freedom. He has the right to have an opinion. But he certainly, in my opinion... <laughs> wasn't very kind, all right? And that can destroy relationships. So sometimes you can give your opinion, and sometimes there may be an element of truth. It is high to live here. But at the same time, it's how you express yourself that breaks the relationship up that now you won't move ahead. Let me tell you, when Carol and I were putting up the tent and we were growling at each other, that tent wasn't going up, okay? And it wasn't going up. That means there was no difference we were making in a forward motion. Number three. The third is, don't take ourselves too seriously. Some, some people, every issue is a hill for them to die on. Have you ever noticed that? Every issue, it's always something. Listen, relax, chill out. All right, so don't make every issue a hill to die on. Don't take yourself so seriously, all right? Um, my wife and I <clears throat> are at a stage in our life that we are now officially recognizing that we don't remember things as quickly as we used to do. And we forget. Now, I have to tell you, that's hard for me because I blanked myself. <clears throat> I don't want to say the word pride in myself, but I blank myself on I don't forget. I have a memory like an elephant. I can remember dates, things, what I say, what I'm going to do. I just have this, this, this mind over here. Let me tell you, it's going. But I've noticed it in Carol. So, now, <laughs> relax. <laughs> I have. So, so... To help her out, to make it softer, I will say something like when she forgets to do something, I'll simply smile and say, I I worry about you, honey. You know, I kind of worry about you, honey. Well, now when I forget something, guess what I hear? I worry about you. So I'm saying, hey, we still have half a mind apiece and two half a minds make a whole mind. So let's stay together and make this work. 
So a point I'm trying to simply say again, all right, be kind to one another. Show each other how much you really love them. And number four is simply this. Doing things together is often hard work. Some of you, you think it's going to be real easy to do things together. It's going to be very, very hard. Um, Scott Wells, who teaches one of our classes here, is chairman of our deacon team. He wrote all the devotions for the guys, and they've done a great job, a full page for one day, full page for the other, very well thought out. It's so good that I asked him if he might begin praying about taking all my sermons and turning them into a study note notebook to go along with all that we're doing because we're on the radio and we're getting a lot of requests, and I need someone to write, and he's got a gift for it. Here's what he said about union, getting together, doing things together. He said, he gave four words. He said, unanimity. He says, is a shared view by all the people concerned with nobody disagreeing. Is that really unity? Not necessarily. It's just meaning that we all can get on the same page on some surfacey stuff. Like right now, we could all look outside and say, hey, the sun is shining. We're all together on the same concept, aren't we? But does that mean we're all really unified? We all are on one thing, sun shining. That's shallow. Number two, uniformity. Conforming to one standard or rule. All right? We could all have the same standard. When we leave here, we are not going to crash through those windows. We're going to go out the doors. We're going to do it. Pro- that's, we're going to go out uniform. We're going to do it together. Then you have what is called union. Union is joining together of people and organizations to make one whole. I like that. We're all together in this thing together. We have kind of a, a union here. And I like the last. He said unity. Unity is a oneness of mind, heart, and purpose toward a shared interest and goal. Here's what it is. It's not just an outward It's an inward heart. We're in this together. It's like, what's the difference between harmony and unity? One guy interpreted it this way. Carol, don't listen to this, all right? It's the difference between unity and harmony is you can have unity by tying the tails of two cats together and throwing them over a clothesline. You've got unity, but you sure don't have what? You don't have harmony on this thing. And so the harmony comes from a heartfelt. And the heartfelt is this. The heartfelt is we can agree on, on, let me go a little bit deeper. We can, go, we, we can agree on our music. We can agree on the air conditioning. We can agree on some of the programs and ministries that we have. And I appreciate all that. And we have that all here. But I think it's more than just all of that. I believe that which brings us the greatest harmony is when we have chosen that at our core value is that we will genuinely love one another where they are, give God the time to grow them where they are, participate when we can to help them, but to do it with um, vitamins, a little bit of medicine, but no sandpaper. Follow me? And that's really the core of this. The rest of the stuff, I think, will come more naturally, watch this, and more sustainably if at the core of all this, it really works. Let me tell you a true story behind the scenes because I see Denise over here. I'm sorry, it's going on radio now. But um, your daughter came when we first got our drums in the back and she said, could I play the drums? And by the way, you'll know our drums are drums that are electric drums. And that's because I can turn the volume down in on the back. But anyway, so we have the drums up there. And I said, now... Brindy, you're going to play the drums. She's in uh, Bible school now. And so I said, um, when you play the drums, I want you to play it for two people. She said, who? And she's looking out. Who Who should I play it for? Mom? No, I said, no. You play for two people. Number one, you play it so when you hit those drums, Jesus smiles at you. So is your heart right? She said, what do you mean your heart? I said, drummers play the drums mo- mostly for one reason. She said, what's that? I said, to be heard. You know, <laughs> and I said, you want to be making Jesus smile. I said, number one, Jesus. And then she said, who's the second person you should play? She said, very simple. Here's who you play the drums for, the second person. In the congregation, the person who hates drums in the church, you play it for that person. You let them know how sweetly those drums, because it's all a part of God's mechanism. You know why? Because the heart of that was not the drums. The heart of that is, do you love all those people? And if you do, that's the bottom line. Now, that's where I'm going with the sermon today. So I hope you're ready. You got your Bibles? You want to get them out? Turn to John chapter 15. This is going to be the core passage. If you don't have a Bible, that's all right. Find a Bible in the chair in front of you. I'm using the New American. I like it more of a literal um, than an equivalent version. But if you do the NIV and equivalent, that's fine. That's all right. But you'll follow more easily if you have the New American. And that's in there. It's the smaller Bible. If you want it, you can keep it. Any Bibles we have in the chairs, take them home with you. That's fine. But I want you to open it up to John chapter 15. I really want to thank Greg because he read some of the verse already this morning. But if you will, follow along quietly while I read to you verse 9 through verse 15. Capture 
the essence of this passage. You always want to look at the big picture as you come down to the minute little pieces. Jesus is speaking, of course, and he says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide, I love it, in my love. Again, dream work makes the team work. One dream, one team. Together we can make a difference, but it has to be in love. Verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Hmm, that's interesting. Verse 11, These things have I spoken to you so that my joy... Maybe in you, Woo! not our self-manufactured joy, but his joy in us that your joy may be made full. Implying that you might have some joy, but it's not going to be full until you have my joy. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. I will come back to that later on, folks. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends, if you do what I command you. And the last for today, no longer do I call you slaves. I like that better than servants. For the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. All right, now I'm going to make some sense out of that under our topic here of together we can make a difference. I need you to hold your place here because I'm going to give you five truths on this. Some of it's going to come from this area, but before I do, I've got to lay a theological foundation, so I need you to kind of wake up and lean into this because I want to make a bigger point before I give you this application. So when we get to this, hold your place here, and you're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. It's easy to find Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is the last chapter in your Bible if you have it upside down. All right, so first one... Genesis chapter 1, if you will. Genesis chapter 1. This is an important truth, and I hope you get it. In order for us to do things together that can make a difference, I I need to recognize the Godhead always works together. If I only could leave you with one principle today, if you could only take a one point home, it would be that the Godhead always works together. When you take that truth, from that truth, it's like that's the rock that hits the pond and all the other truths come out of that, that the Godhead all works together. And I think I can prove just about every other doctrine around the fact that the Godhead is not in um, opposition to one another. I'm going to now show you three different ways that the Godhead is working together because I want you to see this. I'm laying the foundation, then I'm going to come in for the main main application. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, only one verse. Kids, look at your dad's Bible, look at your Bible, follow along. I'm going to make a point here. It says, then God said, so who's speaking? God. What does he say? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let's just stop there. When you read that, you're thinking, now, who in the world is he talking with? Is he talking to Adam? No. Why wasn't he talking to Adam? He wasn't created yet. Was he talking to Eve? No, she wasn't created yet. Was he talking to the birds? I don't think so. So who in the world was he talking to? He was actually talking to himself. But it said us there. Now, that's the word. You want to underline the word us. Let us, plural, make man in our, underline it, plural, according to our likeness, plural. Now that you have that, let me give you a little bit of a language study. Can you handle this now? Here we go. In the Hebrew, you have what is known as singular, dual, and plural. All right? So when you read it into the Hebrew, you're going to see singular, dual, and plural. When we read this, it could look like there's just two there. It could be like us, like Carol and me. That's an us. But in Hebrew, it would be a dual. However, in this passage of Scripture, you need to know that it's in an idiom that says that it's plural. So that's implied, and that's very important because in the Hebrew, they make the distinction between singular, dual, and plural. So it's not like just God and one other part of the Godhead speaking. It's like all three of them are because now when you have plural, you have three or more. So you have one, singular, two, dual, plural, three or more. So now this is not in the dual sense. So there's not two. There is three or more. Now we know that the three would be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying that for this. That inter-Trinitarian communication, that's a heavy theological term, which really means the Lord's talking to himself. All right. So he's talking to himself and he says, let us make man in our image. So that's the together. 
Now watch this. Together, we can make a difference. So he not only said, let us do it. He said, let us do it. Now watch this. The rest of the verse says, he then did it. So you had them working together, making a difference. So the Godhead is our model that they are working together. It's not like God says, let's make man our own. And Jesus says, no, not that way. Let's do it this way. And the Holy Spirit says, wait a minute. You're going to start doing this. There's no arguments going on. They're all in it together. And they're going to make a huge difference. Now, if you want to, in your margin, just write John chapter 1. I've already gone through John. We've taught the gospel of John. And so go through John chapter 1, and you're going to see that Jesus was there with God at the beginning of creation, and he was there before then. So they're all in this thing together. Second truth, go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians. Creation is number 1. The second one is the distribution and use of spiritual gifts. Chapter 1, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, rather. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Flip over there quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to see that the Godhead is working together to make a difference. The Godhead is working together. He's the template of this whole thing. The Godhead is doing this. Now stay with me. I know you're going to... I know all that. I agree with that. Of course he works all together. Now you're zoning out thinking about the beach. But don't do that. Because I need to show you something. Because that truth works much deeper in our own life of doing things together. All right, let's look at chapter 12, verse 1, 1 Corinthians. Paul says to the Corinthian church that was already divided, that's that's another whole sermon right there, but they're not working together. And he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware or ignorant as some scripture says. So I don't want you to be unaware, implying that it's very easy to be unaware. So I don't want you to be ignorant in this. I want you to know it. Now drop down, if you will, for a moment to verse four. So he says, regarding spiritual gifts, wise up, verse four. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. Take a moment and circle the word spirit. All right? Variety of gifts, same spirit. Verse 5. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. Circle the word Lord. Verse 6. There are varieties of effects, all regarding spiritual gifts and ministries, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So you have spirit, you have Lord, and you have God. Again, you have the Trinity. They're all in it together. And they are distributing spiritual gifts. So they're in it together. Now, if you will look up here for a moment. So now he explains the gifts, the Trinity. He gives the gifts. And when he gives the gifts, the purpose of the gifts, listen very carefully, is to do this. To glorify the Lord by serving one another so that they're built up so that other people can come to faith in Jesus Christ and they then can glorify the Lord. I'm saying all that now to say this. The Trinity works together regarding spiritual gifts to make a difference. Are you with me so far? He did it at creation. He's doing it right now. Every time someone comes to know Christ as Savior, part of that recreation, that rebirth, is the reception of spiritual gifts. He's doing that. Now, that's my, the big part of my argument. I don't have time. I'm going to run out of time. So let me give you a third one. It's not in your notes. For those of you that are post-toasty Christians, want a little bit more. John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. And you're going to see again that God the Father and God the Son are working together for the, uh, the communication of faith alone in Christ for the world. All right? So we can call it evangelism. Now, I'm not going to go there. Now come back up over here for air. Here's a question. Is the Trinity all on the same page making a difference? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Scripture says, Jesus in us, the hope of glory. Corinthians says, the Spirit of God who is in you. We know that God is in you. So we could say, the Trinity is in us. We can also say, we who know Christ as Savior, we are a partaker of His divine nature. So the nature of God is their connectivity to one another, their togetherness of one another. So that nature is inside of us and the very core value is that the Spirit, Christ, and God are together. Now, why am I telling you that? Let me use my wife and I again for an illustration. If Christ is all together and I'm vitally connected to Him, which is going to be our passage in a moment, and I am, that means I have all the capacity within me through the ministry and the function of the Godhead, to be in proper relationship. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Not so much merely with Carol, but with the God who is inside of Carol. So to the degree that she's yielding to the Lord and that whole theological concept of trusting in Him and allowing the Godhead to live out Himself through her to me. And I do that. There's no reason for us ever 
to be on an opposite page. Now, that doesn't mean just because I like anchovies that God will make her like anchovies, okay? That's not where I'm going with this. Where I am going with this is that we will love the unlovable. We will sacrifice whatever it takes to reach lost people for Christ. We will do what we can to make a difference for the glory of the Lord together. Whatever God calls us to do in Scripture, I can do it now because the Godhead dwells inside of me. She does that and we become more on the same page. So you need to know that. That's why this is the core value. If you only remember this part and you now meditate on it, you now open your scriptures and you go through that, you're going to see the beautiful mechanism functioning, well-oiled together. But let me give you a couple more and then we'll let you go home. I also need to follow Jesus as my role model. Go back now to our main passage. Let's go back to John chapter 15. I need to follow the Lord as my, my wonderful role model. And I hope you do too. So if you will, look at verse 9 and verse 12, all right? Got your Bibles? Verse 9 says, now follow me. This gets, really, this gets really good. This is so cool. Watch this. Pay attention now. Just as the Father has loved me, so you have God the Father loving Christ. Just pause for a moment. A perfect Christ and a perfect Father, perfect Son, and the perfect Father loving the perfect Son, you must have perfect love going back and forth. All right. Then it says, just as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. So God loves me, I love you. Go to verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. So now look up here. I want you to see this beautiful train. We have a perfect God with a perfect love, loving with a perfect love, the perfect son. And the perfect love from a perfect father loving the perfect son is now loving me with all my imperfections. I love that part because now we can look back and say, oh, it's easy for God the Father to love the the, the Son because the perfect Father and the perfect Son, it's easy to love with a perfect love because everybody's perfect. But now you got a fly in the ointment. you got a speed bum in life. you got me. And God says, I love my Son. My Son loves me. Now, a lot of people want to stop there because they are so famished for being loved. And so they're just sucking in all of God's love. And that's why you got all this music on, oh, God loves me and I love him and all this. Because blah, 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 they're just so empty with this stuff. And part of that's okay. Because part of that is you need to be filled with the love of God. You need to understand that. You need to embrace that. You need to watch this. Abide in that love in his word. But now it doesn't stop there. I believe the purpose of God loving the son and the son now loving me is so that now I am to love. Look at the verse. It doesn't say, now go and love the lovable. It says, go and love one another. And that one another would be all the irregular people, the sandpaper people, all the people that are really tough. So how do you make that happen? Again, without putting you under the law of deeds and principles, just go back. God loves the Son. The Son loves me. How does He love me? Unconditionally. He cares enough for me to also confront me. And so he confronts me with truth and now I come to other people and I love them and I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to do what I can because that's what working together is all about. When we stop loving one another, watch this, I believe that's our very first step away from working well together. Did you hear what I said? When I don't love that other person, all of a sudden I at least began to put up one brick in a wall from being together with that person. So folks, if now you got enough out of point number one, maybe point number two is all you need. And that's so heavy that you've got to take that truth and run it through the grid of the people that you're living with. You've got to run it through that neighbor. I have a neighbor. I got a, we got a bunch of neighbors. They're all good neighbors, even our, our weird neighbors. But i got a neighbor, and this neighbor works and comes in at 3.30 in the morning. Now that's not a problem because I'm usually up at 4. But I don't want to get up at 3.30. 4 is plenty, you know. And this neighbor comes in, parks the car, no rock music playing, but they have a dog. This dog is one part pit bull, one part Rottweiler, and one part Sharpe. All right? It's, it's a strange dog. It's the nicest looking dog, but it's got a growl that just, oh, it scares me. And this neighbor comes in and, oh, and they name the dog Toast. Okay. Hey, Toast, come here. Blum, blum, ah, ah. Right underneath my window. Our houses are so close we can hear each other flush the toilet. It's that close. And I'm hearing that. 
You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Thank you.